Would it be appropriate if you start with a prayer? Uh, thank you, friends, and thank you for those beautiful devotionals. Uh, always lifts up our spirit. Um, dear Farooz has told me that this is a fireside. Um, and a few hours ago, she wrote to me uh, to begin by saying a few words about the Baha'i faith, uh, because naturally everything that I will say is inspired uh, by Baha'i teachings. Uh, so I will obey that. Uh, it will only take two or three minutes. Um, and then if there are other comments and questions, We'll be happy to respond. But as you know, the Baha'i faith is a world religion whose purpose is to unite all the races and peoples in one universal cause and one common faith. And Baha'is are followers of Baha'u'llah, who they believe is a promised one of all ages. As you know, the traditions uh, of almost every people include the promise of a future when peace and harmony will be established on earth and humankind uh, will live in prosperity. Uh, we believe that the promised hour has come and that Baha'u'llah is a great personage whose teachings will enable humanity to build a new world. In one of his writings, Baha'u'llah says, that which the Lord has ordained as the sovereign remedy and mightiest instrument for the healing of all the world is the union of all his peoples in one universal cause, one common faith. Uh, so friends, with that uh, brief introduction, um, I can share with you um, that this uh, subject um, uh, of harmony of science and religion in its broad terms, and specifically uh, regarding the coherence between ethics and artificial intelligence uh, is highly relevant today um, be because, as you know from general uh, information in the media, uh, development of this technology will impact uh, nearly all the uh, professions, all the jobs, all the uh, workflows, all the ways of uh, the way the uh, Western society will operate. Um, I think the person that will be least affected would be a hairdresser because she will take a scissor and cut your hair uh, independent of what AI might or might not do. Uh, but uh, we can think of AI as almost um, equivalent to the invention of electricity. If you think about uh, what the human society looked like uh, two centuries ago before electricity was used and then how the society was transformed after the uh, invention and use of electricity in all its forms. Um, so uh, should I share some slides? Would that be helpful? All right, let me see if I can do that. That sounds wonderful. Okay. Um, does the system allow me to share? Yes, you're a co-host. Oh, I'm a co-host. Okay, yes. very well. Very well. So um, let me see where I can find the button for sharing. Uh, I apologize, I should have done this earlier. Um, uh, I think it might be highlighted in green about halfway through your bar. It says- Yes, I got that. I got that. Thank you. That's very good. Um, I've seen that now. And if I can just bring up the page that I want to share, um, I can then share it with you. Uh, how about now? Are you able to see? We see it. Thank you. We do. Yes. Very good. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, the, the goal of this conversation is really to respond uh, to your uh, needs because the subject is very vast. We cannot cover it in one session and I don't want to be prolonged. Uh, I will not read my own slides. I'm sure you will. Um, but I will talk fairly quickly through the slides uh, and then if you have uh, questions and so on, feel free to either uh, note your questions and, and we'll come back to it um, or in any other way that our chairperson uh, requires you to do. So what I will do in the, call, in the talk is first describe the elements of a conceptual framework with which the Baha'i community itself operates. Uh, then I will describe uh, some systems of artificial intelligence, describe this problem of alignment between 
what AI is trying to do and what um, human communities, human societies want to do. Um, talk about the centrality of knowledge uh, and contributing to building a new civilization. And then we can uh, reflect on all of this together. So first, the conceptual framework. Many of you who are long time Baha'is and active in the uh, processes of expansion, consolidation in social action and in public discourse are well familiar with this idea of a conceptual framework according to which the Baha'i community uh, studies and operates. Uh, in fact, the uh, Universal House of Justice have said this, that the elements required for a concerted effort to infuse the diverse regions of the world with the spirit of Baha'u'llah's revelation have crystallized. This was written in 2005 into a framework uh, for action that needs only to be exploited. How lucky we are that we have such an explicit guidance uh, that we can, we can follow. The goal is uh, to enable all men, um, these are the words of Baha'u'llah, that all men have been created to carry forward an ever-advancing civilization. So other than this concept of this, how do we enable that? How do you and I, a few people, can start doing that and then uh, help others as well? So we have to understand the meaning of the framework. I can use this by an example. Imagine if you are a painter and you have a canvas. And you know the canvas is uh, some kind of a material uh, affixed usually to a rectangular wooden frame. And that is the frame of your painting. You can paint inside of that, but you cannot go outside. If you go outside that frame, uh, you cannot paint. So uh, think of that analogy as the framework that the House of Universal House of Justice has created for us. Um, so we want to know what are the elements of it. And then once we know the elements, we are asking, is it a rigid? Uh, does it change? Does it evolve? And we will talk about the fact that the framework itself uh, is not rigid, but also is not fluid. It has a structure. Uh, and over time, uh, it can evolve. Uh, and how it evolves over time is through cycles um, that we do in the clusters or the communities. And an individual or an assembly can uh, function according to these cycles of study, consultation, planning, action, and then reflecting on those action, uh, as we say often in three months. So you divide your year into four cycles of three months, and in each month, at the beginning of each one of these cycles, uh, you study guidance, you consult, uh, you plan how to act, um, and then you take carry out those actions and come back and reflect on it. And by doing that, uh, the next cycle will be better than today. So what we often say is that don't be scared of making mistakes because no mistake will last more than three months. Uh, you yourselves will correct that mistake. So what are the elements of that framework? Uh, these uh, overall principles, you know the Baha'i faith is organized according to the principle of oneness. Um, we are mindful of justice. We love truth. We thirst for knowledge. We are attracted to beauty. Um, we assume a humble posture of learning. And we are aware of these twofold moral purpose. Um, that means we have to transform ourselves uh, and also help transform the society. Uh, so it is important that the framework that we construct, first of all, we have, a, have to have a good understanding of it. It will be helpful if each one of us sit down with pen and paper and try to uh, draw pictures or write down uh, what are the elements of our framework, uh, because that can also be a framework for our own life, for our career, for our education, for our job, for our marriage, everything we do, this can be a framework. So one of the things that this framework has is that it should be uh, free from contradiction. For example, you cannot say, I believe in oneness, but I would like to discriminate against certain races. That is a contradiction, so don't do that. Also, we should not fragment, meaning that anything we, we have to analyze. When you want to analyze the society or the environment around you, you have to divide it into um, elements so that you can analyze them, but be careful that this fragmentation does not last too long, that you are able to bring it back together and synthesize what you have analyzed. Uh, if you are the principles that you are well familiar with, and I will not go through, but this idea that the Universal House of Justice has brought, this is the three protagonists of change, and also the idea that the beloved guardian brought, the twin process of integration and disintegration, these two concepts actually uh, are very profound and they enable even the friends of the faith once they understand these concepts and they know what they are, they can use them uh, in the analysis of their own uh, environment. 
so I'm rushing through, but I think that should be okay. Gives us more time for uh, for questions and answers. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, the origins of this thing. So uh, uh, I, I actually did my graduate studies uh, in Canada at the University of British Columbia um, some 30 years ago. Um, and it was focused, because I'm an electrical engineer, it was focused on uh, algorithms and recognizing patterns in sounds and in images. And this is what today we call AI. At the time, it was also called AI, but it wasn't so popular, you know. Uh, once chat GPT came, then AI became, you know, enormously popular and everybody is talking about it. So uh, it, its origin comes from understanding uh, audio, uh, speech, music, uh, tech, written text, um, natural language, uh, or, or pictures, or a sequence of pictures in the form of a video. So the origin of uh, pattern recognition comes from uh, these fields. Then something new happened. Uh, in science, I will describe this very briefly without going through it, is that uh, instead of handcrafting uh, these algorithms, there is a way to teach the computer. Uh, by teach, we mean, uh, you know, a, a, a human being or even some forms of animals, you can teach them. And how you teach them is that um, you show pictures of dogs and cats uh, and you say, this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a cat. Um, and uh, that person or that primate um, can learn. Uh, so in the computer science, they uh, uh, try to create computational uh, nodes that mimic the work of the neural network. It has nothing to do with humans or human brain. It just is inspired by the way biology works. Um, so you can teach it, show pictures of cats, uh, and you can adjust the weights of this uh, network so that the output will say cat. And when you show it the dog, it will show you a dog. Uh, but this network is not memorizing. It is learning the pattern. As a result of that, you can show a picture of a cat that the network has never seen, and it will give you the correct answer. And you say, wow, how is this possible? You know, it has never seen this form of a cat. And it does. And this whole thing came, this deep learning came in 19, sorry, in, in 2012. So it's not uh, an old uh, science. Um, and by 2014, um, the networks were able to um, match or even increase over human capability. Uh, and so that uh, really caused many, many universities um, to uh, turn to study, uh, trying to understand it and so forth. And also companies trying to make uh, applications from it. So numerous applications uh, are possible um, related to these uh, images or sounds or text and so forth. Um, there are some conversational AI. You can talk to the computer uh, either by typing or by voice. Um, and, and then you, you can you have heard about self-driving cars or self-navigating robots or drones and so on. Also applications in medical images so that the network can learn to segment various organs in medical images and so on. And then what has emerged are these uh, massive online open course systems, um, which uh, at Stanford University just a few years ago, they offered the course uh, and 600,000 students registered. It was free. So, um, and you would get a certificate that you've been to Stanford. So, so that, that was the motive, right? Um, but the fact that uh, one professor plus maybe a handful of teaching assistants were able to mark those 600,000 homeworks every week and give feedback to the students um, give you an idea of what uh, it can do. So there is a new field uh, in AI that came out just three or four years ago. It's called generative AI. Uh, generative AI is different from the analytical AI is the one that I just described to you because generative AI is able to generate, uh, for example, you say the word uh, mountain or type the word mountain it will come up with a picture of a mountain, not one from the internet, one that the computer makes up. Um, so, uh, but be careful about this because when you say generative, that means the, the computer is generating. It is making stuff up. So it can make the stuff up that doesn't exist and also some things that are not factual. So we have, this is where the danger of AI uh, resides is that, um, 
you can use it for all kind of applications, but be careful, uh, verify it. <laughs> Maybe you verify it with Google. You ask the generative AI to generate something, and then you verify it by Google to see if it is telling the truth and so on. So um, there are th th this whole field is, uh, is moving. Uh, th the, the problem is this, that what it generates sounds plausible. That means it sounds, you, you know, you can ask questions from the Ruhi books uh, from ChatGPT. It will answer you. And the answers are very close to truth. They are plausible. Um, so some Baha'is who have difficulty when it says, from your junior youth group, did you observe? They don't know how to answer. You can type it in. It will give you the answer. Um, <laughs> so so the, I, I'm saying that just so you can see the power of generative AI. Uh, but it also has a lot of problems. Um, for example, um, in face recognition, uh, it, it, um, it, it doesn't recognize uh, black faces as easily as white faces. Why is that? Not because the algorithm is racist, but because there, there were fewer white faces in the training of the network. And this is always there. You cannot, you cannot change that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the alignment problem. Uh, uh, you see, in in uh, in our communities, uh, in our society, we are we are saying that it's important that people of different races, different genders, different ethnicities, are all have a place at the table. That is true. AI may not do that as easily. The training data itself may have biases. Um, what about the question of fairness? Let me give you an example. If in the criminal justice system. You use AI to predict which prisoners, those who have committed a crime, were convicted, are now in prison, and you are thinking about releasing them after some years of imprisonment. Uh, you need to use some method to predict which one of them will be repeat offenders and which one will um, integrate into society successfully. Right? If you use AI for that, it will always condemn the minorities. Why? Because it goes by the current data. The problem is that when you go with the current data, the current data is the result of oppression, is the result of injustice. That's where the current data is. So if you mimic the current data, you perpetuate injustice. So I mentioned here that models are the problem, not the machines. <laughs> so uh, a number of uh, universities and companies are now working on something they call trustworthy AI meaning a kind of an AI that you can apply. However, uh, if it is trustworthy in one application, it's not trustworthy in, in another application, and so on and so forth. So AI itself is not evil, uh, but it can be used, especially in the hand of dictatorial governments. It can, you know, for surveillance and security and violation of privacy and all kinds of things. So it is really, really problematic. Uh, but is here. And so many companies and universities and organizations and governments are going to be using it. So what is the solution? Um, let me spend a few minutes on the solution. So one of the principles that uh, we talked about at the beginning is this question of uh, the centrality of knowledge. So uh, if you think about knowledge and where does knowledge come from, um, most people accept that science is a system of knowledge. Uh, but if you mention that religion is also a system of knowledge, um, people may ask question: how, how is that possible? I thought religion was all about fanaticism and superstition and rituals, you know? So that's because the word religion is being maligned, is being hijacked, is being used for all kind of um, uh, bad purposes. So if you use the word religion in the sense that Baha'is use, meaning as a, a progressive revelation, that there's only one God for all religions, that this God reveals his revelation in steps every thousand years or so, in different chapters. And so Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, Bob, and Baha'u'llah are different chapters of the same book. Uh, then the book of Revelation um, becomes uh, meaningful. And you're not talking about uh, rituals, and you're not talking about what the priest or the mullah has done to the religion. Uh, the Baha'i community itself is a dialogical community, meaning... We act, we reflect, we do not pretend that we have the absolute truth. We invite everybody to join with us in that. Uh, today, in the society, 
the central process of social existence is making money and using making money for accessing power. And by power, uh, it is usually mean power to oppress others. Uh, so we want to move completely away from that. The Baha'i community is uh, hoping to create a new society, completely different from the current society. In this new society, the central process of social existence would be the acquisition of knowledge and the application of it. You know, generation, application, diffusion of knowledge. And therefore, the Baha'i faith calls on all people. We don't differentiate between the global north and the global south. We don't have in our vocabulary something called third world. We don't have it. It's not there. We are calling on all people of the world, and 185 of them have national spiritual assemblies. So we call on all these countries to engage to better their own material and spiritual uh, existence, to prosper in both the dimensions, material, with a humble posture of learning, following a learning process, following the conceptual framework that we talked about. So if we do that, then we say that science and religion are two sources of knowledge for study and action. And if we accept that as a foundation to start with, uh, then also we have to accept that, that just like science is relative, relative because we discover something new, you know, and the time of Aristotle, science was that the planets revolve around the earth. Uh, and it's chemistry, it's biology, it's physics, it's um, uh, anatomy, it's medicine, all of them supported the same paradigm. And then Newton came and the paradigm changed. And then came Albert Einstein and the paradigm changed again. So science evolves. It is not that Newtonian science is bad or wrong. We're just saying it no longer applies in certain circumstances. Actually, in many, many circumstances, still the easiest equation to use would be the Newtonian law of gravitation because we're not talking about quantum or something like that. So once that is the case, then both science and religion are not absolute, but are a model of reality. It is a series of insights. And if you think of it like that, and especially we can say that everybody, Baha'i and non-Baha'i, friends of the faith should learn what is the universal house of justice and study the messages of the universal house of justice because that is the fruit of learning. You see, when we say science, we don't mean only physics and chemistry. We also mean economics. We also mean psychology. We also mean sociology. Those are also social. What is the next word? Social sciences. So if those are social sciences, then the study of the universal house of justice and messages contributes to the advancement of those sciences. And in fact, the Baha'i faith says that everybody should try to be a scholar of greater or lesser uh, impact, but nonetheless a scholar. So who is a scholar? You see, what, this is what the House of Justice says, that access to knowledge is the right of every human being, participation in its generation, application and diffusion, a responsibility that all must shoulder in the great enterprise of building a prosperous world civilization. Each individual, according to his or her talents and abilities, and that justice demands universal participation. So that brings us to this final uh, remark about uh, participation. We want, the reason why we want everybody to participate in expansion and consolidation, the way we want to say that the Baha'is, the veteran Baha'is, the youth, the children, uh, the families, the uh, groups of um, uh, friends of the faith in the receptive neighborhood, everybody must appear, um, must participate uh, you see, that, that's what the House of Justice again wrote. This document comes from, that must participate in, in this act of collective process of learning. Such a process would allow its participants to engage in the generation, application, diffusion of knowledge. It could be knowledge about community building. It could be knowledge about uh, agriculture. It could be knowledge about uh, what food would we, we should eat to be healthy. Uh, it should be knowledge about microfinance. Uh, and so all of these social actions that the Baha'i community uh, engages in are included in this discussion about, uh, about knowledge. Baha'u'llah wrote that the well-being of mankind is peace and security are unattainable unless and until its unity is firmly established. As we listen to our news media, to the 
CNN or cable news or any other news, we can see the degree to which the world is unstable. The way one dictator can invade a neighboring country and nobody can do anything about it. Uh, why? Because the foundation for the establishment of a world government has not been laid. Because the task of building a unified world, which started with the League of Nations at the end of the First World War and expanded to the United Nations, was left incomplete in the 20th century. How does this be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age you live in? And center your deliberations on its exigencies and requirements. So, just to conclude, this is my last slide. What we are saying is this, that all peoples in all countries should be involved in the generation and application of knowledge, including knowledge that has relates to algorithms, to AI, to uh, technology, or to any other aspect of it. That science and religion are two complementary sources of knowledge. That the world should not be divided into producers and consumers of technology. That that by itself is unjust. That generative AI of the kind that we did talked about is a planetary development, will profoundly affect every area of work and societal life. Almost invariably, it will have unintended consequences wherever it is used. And so we need to put guardrails around it. If the society leaves this just in the hand of the companies and corporations who are motivated only by money, we are going to find ourselves in a very big mess. That is why every community should be involved in ethical decisions to put in place guardrails appropriate to their society. And the experience of the Baha'i faith in community building, social action, and public discourse offers a working model for all societies to achieve ethically coherent results. So I'm going to stop share and invite you to comment. I see some applause. I don't know if you, you can hear them, but there's if you look around the screen, lots of applause. Those were very potent, um, dense slides with a lot of concepts. Thank you. Would you want to drink a water? You were just talking for <laughs> 30 minutes straight. I will get some. Get and some. I already see a hand up by Ferguson. Ferguson, you're my first in line with your question. Ferguson, kindly unmute and um, ask your question. Uh, thank you so much. So I'm calling in from uh, Yokohama, Japan, and I'm pleased to, to be here. Yeah, um, so um, I have a question rather than a comment, but leveraging um, a couple of things that you mentioned, uh, such as um, you know the, the need, really the requirement that we all participate, um, and uh, your uh, other comment about uh, how unhelpful it is that we divide the world into, uh, into um, uh, producers and consumers of technology. Um, um, how is it that uh, those, how is it that people who are in the lay technology world um, can best participate in um, the growth and development, the nurturing of ethical AI? Thank you. I do not know if I have the full answer, but I can make a few comments. Uh, you are well aware that the, at the end of the Second World War, uh, many countries, United Nations and others, they decided that um, it is not good enough only for um, North America and Western Europe and a few uh, countries maybe in Asia uh, to be advanced and the others remain behind. Uh, so they wanted to uh, contribute to the development. Uh, so the first thing they did is divided the world into developed and less developed. Then they decided that less developed is offensive. So they changed it developing. Okay, very well. Um, but what they actually did was to go there with money, without consultation. There are numerous examples of this. For example, um, uh, under grant from... Uh, SIDA, the uh, Swedish International Development Agency, uh, a few Swedish 
uh, well-wishers uh, went to Zambia and they looked around, they found a village that doesn't have clean water, that women walked five miles to go to the river uh, to get some water. So they uh, immediately uh, uh, connected with their embassy in Sweden and imported um, uh, some machinery, uh, dug a well, um, put a solar uh, power source, connected it to an electric uh, motor to pump water. And then they left and they reported how well they have used their development funding only to find out that two years later when they come back um, for a victory lap to find that nobody has used the well, uh, the motor is broken, uh, the solar panel is uh, you know, dysfunctional um, and, and that's it. Uh, and uh, so when they talk to the people to say, well, why is it? Uh, they found out that uh, this was a infusion, an injection of a different society in this case, Swedish, Western, into a different society without consultation, without empowerment, without ownership. And so uh, development projects uh, failed, uh, not in this small scale, uh, billions of dollars in the 1960s and 70s was spent towards development projects, nearly all of which became a failure. And so there are numerous reports at the United Nations that we don't know why, but nothing seems to be working. OK, uh, some people concluded that uh, maybe uh, uh, may maybe um, uh, they don't want this or they don't need this or whatever explanation they brought uh, didn't have anything to do with, um, yeah, uh, with, with growth and development. Uh, so uh, what the Baha'i community is doing today is through the guidance of the House of Justice, they are empowering uh, clusters, villages uh, everywhere, including in Africa, to take ownership. They start from a devotional gathering. They add a children classes and a junior youth group. Maybe they also uh, tutor some study circles to multiply the number of tutors and multiple animators. And then once this is well established as a foundation, then they begin to think about their material development within the context of their own society. And they say, what can we do? Maybe they do a microfinance, for example, uh, creating a local bank with a small amount of uh, assets to lend money to uh, African women uh, under, without collateral, um, on the trust that the community will encourage them to pay back. Uh, and, and they find out that, oh, wow, this works. Um, and so they uh, improve their agriculture, they improve their health. So it will take a long time. It will not be something that you will do, uh, you know, in one year or two years. But overall, it is a foundation on which you can build. So if you understand the basic principles, then what we have to do is to say each community, each society, each cluster, according to its own needs. It could be a cluster in North America that is talking about uh, you know, establishing these spiritual principles of the four core activities and on build on that uh, their social action for material development under the guidance of the Baha'i International Development Organization. And once a few examples are uh, found that works well, these are shared through our public discourse. And so the human society will begin to see that while the rest of the world is busy tearing everything apart and engaging in war, the Baha'is are building the future civilization. Uh, so that's just a few basic principles. Um, how do I connect that to AI? Well, you know, if there's an app on your uh, smartphone and many people in South America or Asia or Africa now have, tele have mobile phone, you know, all the communities who never had a wired phone, now they have mobile phone. So uh, they, they learn that if there's an app that uses AI for something, they have to ask themselves the question, is this right? Is this just? Is this fair? Does it work correctly? Does it um, agree with the elements of our framework? And if not, don't use it. Governments should likewise um, allow or disallow uh, certain apps depending on how they're being used so that slowly, slowly, those applications are prevalent that uh, promote justice 
and unity. Wow, that's a great answer. And I love how you ended. Promote justice and unity. Shala, um, if you want to go ahead with your question. Yes, uh, I love your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, this idea of science and religion going hand in hand uh, that the Baha'i faith has been promoting has been a really interesting subject. Uh, when we were Baha'i youth in Britain uh, and somebody had developed this and we would go as a gang to one of the universities, there would be a presentation on science and religion going hand in hand. It was interesting. It was a new subject and some people were looking at it. Uh, if the, you were very religious, you saw it as non-essential having science involved. And if you are a scientist, you considered religion on non-essential. But today, I think, I don't know any, any people or culture that have not seen the importance of science and religion going to hand in hand. And recently I received a little uh, video that shows this beautiful AI girl and she's being interviewed. And as she's being interviewed, she's asked, do you know this and do you know that? And what can you do about this? And her knowledge and ability is beyond belief. And then they said, there must be nothing that you need or want. And she said, yes, there is something that I don't have that I want. And the interviewer said, what is that? And she said, a soul. I started crying. I was so touched by the fact that this AI yearned for a soul. What do you think of that idea that even AI who has bypassed many of us has this yearning for a soul? I wonder if you have any, I have another question, but I'll go with this first. Sure, sure, I'll be happy to. So, <clears throat> Uh, the way uh, AI works, I, I'm, I didn't want to go too much into the science part of it or technology part of it, but there are these things called large language models. Um, I gave you the example of uh, image classification so that the, the model can tell whether an image is a dog or a cat, okay? That is an example of um, supervised training, meaning you have to collect several thousand images of dogs and cats. You have to label them, which one is a dog, which one is a cat. And then you have to feed that together with this label to the network to learn. That's supervised. Then um, the problem with supervised uh, training uh, is that it uh, is limited. You, you can only label so much. It's a very laborious work to try to sit down and, uh, and label images. Uh, so then, scientific community, engineering community looked for um, self-supervised uh, architectures of AI models. Uh, these self-supervised models um, uh, scrape the internet. So let's first talk about language. Um, you may have heard that there is a company uh, called OpenAI uh, and they developed GPT um, uh, and, and then added a chat interface to it so that we can use with it. Uh, and in trying to do their natural language processing, they scraped the internet without asking permission from anybody. That means they went, uh, something is called a crawler. The crawler goes to the internet, finds all the web pages in the world and takes all the text from that and uses that text in order to train the model. So, uh, you know how on your phone, uh, if you try to type the word good, uh, it will immediately give you three options at the bottom uh, to choose. H how does it do that? Because it is connected to a cloud service and the cloud service knows that um, uh, quite often the word good is followed by the word bye, goodbye. Okay? So that's how it knows what three words out of all the words in the dictionary to prompt you, right? Okay, so uh, these large language models are unsupervised or self-supervised models and they learn from whatever it is that they take. Um, you may have also heard that New York Times uh, this couple of weeks ago 
uh, sued OpenAI because they said, you took our um, uh, publications uh, of New York Times and you used all the vocabulary, all the articles that was written forever, you know, last 30 years. Um, it was okay to do it for research, but now you seem to be using it for making money. So we're going to sue you and get our, our portion of the money, right? Okay. <laughs> so large language models uh, do not understand the meaning of what they are saying. Okay? They do not understand the meaning. So there is no meaning and there is no understanding. But there is a method that if you say a single word, it will give you the next word. Or if you give a phrase, it will give you the next phrase. Or if you give a sentence in the form of a question, it will give you another sentence in the form of the answer. And that answer is quite often very accurate. There are some mistakes, but quite often is very accurate. So when you ask uh, an AI uh, natural language um, interface, you ask the question, uh, you have everything, do you need anything else? It will say, I need a soul. Because it learned that maybe from Shakespeare, maybe from Shori Effendi, maybe from uh, whatever text it was that it had ingested and learned. That's why on ChatGPT, you can say, can you write a paragraph and describe the work of, uh, you know, this community of this local assembly, but do it in the style, please don't do this. Do it in the style of Shori Effendi. It will do it. How it will know to do it? Because it has ingested all the books of the faith, which are free. And so it knows how to write an article or a paragraph in the style of, of Einstein or in the style of Shakespeare or in the style of Shogifen. Do not uh, think that uh, the network has any understanding. There's absolutely zero understanding. That's why sometimes it also gives you very wrong answers. Uh, the technical uh, name for those answers is hallucination. We say generative AI hallucinates. That's a technical word for it. Okay. That means it makes stuff up. We do not know how to fix it. When technology goes forward, maybe we can train them in such a way as to, um, you know, fix these problems. But do not ascribe understanding to this. If I can give you a reference, uh, there is a, a philosopher in the West known as John Serley. Uh, Mr. Paul Lampel, in his book, Revelation and Social Reality, also makes a reference to this philosopher, John Serley. John Serley has something called a Chinese room. And he says that, imagine that you do not know the, the Chinese language at all. But you are standing in this room, and there is a, um, let's say, a conveyor belt that brings in um, certain uh, uh, boxes, and in, on each box, a character, a Chinese character is written on it. You cannot read them. You do not know what they are. But there are certain rules of grammar that you can take them and rearrange them in such a way as it would make sense in the Chinese language. So the, uh, the conveyor belt brings in random uh, samples for you. You rearrange them, and it goes out. And the person who sits outside who reads Chinese can read those and says, wow, you know Chinese so well, you arranged it, but you don't know anything. You just rearranged the vocabulary to make sense based on certain rules, okay? So this Chinese room example of this philosopher quoted by Mr. Lampel teaches us that AI itself, the machine itself, knows nothing, understands nothing, but it is capable of creating something that is meaningful to us. So when you say, do you, what else do you need? It says, I need a soul. Why? Because somewhere in Shakespearean poetry or in other novels that it ingested, um, there was a talk of soul. There was talk of life, life after death. So the AI will talk about that. The AI may even talk about God. It has no recognition. 
That's so, a great question, Shala. I think a lot of us were, were would have come to that or thought of that great question. If you don't mind, we're going to pass to Quanta right now, Shala. If you want to type your, your other question in the chat, if we get a chance, you're okay? Okay, thank you so much for your great um, reply. And here we go. Uh, Quanta, please. Thank you very much. I appreciate your presentation. I was wondering, because... Um, of the way we sometimes share the faith, we often use the phrase Baha'is believe, Baha'is teach, Baha'is do. I think that because of the concentrated primal point being the Baha'is doing and saying and believing may also lead AI to make some uh, mistakes in terms of not making Baha'u'llah, who is the manifestation of God today. Baha'u'llah teaches, Baha'u'llah wrote, Baha'u'llah instructed, making Baha'u'llah the concentrated primal point, but not so much Baha'i faith teaches because Baha'i faith has come as a result of Baha'u'llah's teachings. So I was wondering, if we should be very, very careful and make Baha'u'llah is the focus of our conversations because he is the one who teaches, not we. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Fully agree. You know, Ruhi Book 6, uh, conversation between Anna and Emilia, that's our standard. And it all talks about Baha'u'llah. Thank you. Okay. Mom... Uh, Mamta. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, I learned a lot from you. At the same time, I have a question that many people all over the world are asking the question, even among the scientists, is the uh, question that if with the advancement so fast of the science and technology that our life will be dominated, and controlled by AI, and we will not have a control on that, and God help us that who had a hand on it initially and how it is set. And the world that we are living in right now is not still the Baha'i world. Still, everybody is uh, after their own benefits. Still, this is a competition, not cooperation then how do you see the, or, or how do you foresee the near future? Is that true? Are we going to have a uh, problem with this AI or no, everything will be okay? Very good question. Wonderful. Um, so uh, we already have problem with AI. We also have a problem <laughs> with uh, Instagram. <laughs> How many young 14-year-old girls um, compare their own body shape with what they see on Instagram and feel depressed? It's a big problem. If the parents don't advise, don't comment, don't guide, if the Baha'i community doesn't absorb that 14-year-old in the junior youth program, they will suffer from the harm that will come to them from Instagram. And AI is everywhere. It is inside Instagram. It's all the algorithms, all the recommendations of if you watch this movie, what should you watch next and all of that, right? So we need to take control of our lives. Uh, it is not true that AI will have an existential, somebody asked this, uh, does AI have an existential uh, danger for human society? Like do, do these robots rebel against humans? and try to overpower humans. They are smarter than us, da, 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 like that, you know? The answer is this, look, this AI resides in a software on your laptop. Close <laughs> your laptop, close your laptop, AI will do no harm to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so AI is not gonna come and do anything, but when people uh, give in, to the inappropriate use of technology, yes, they will be harmed by AI. But also, you know, I was saying that I did my graduate studies at University of British Columbia. What was the subject? 
uh, I used a, a methods of AI in order to classify the image of a mammogram uh, into a benign or malignant tumor. So wow. AI can be very helpful. You see, AI can be very helpful. You can help a radiologist do a better estimate, you know, as a second reader maybe. Uh, that's just one example. Uh, and it was 30 years ago. <laughs> And God knows how many more uh, things exist from AI that are very helpful. So we should not um, throw away AI, but we should put guardrails around it because it, it has the potential of helping and it has great potential of harming. That's why it sort, sort of forces humanity to think about ethical questions. It forces religion to come to the rescue of science. Wonderful. Does that answer your question? Great. We'll move on to Anna, please. Uh, uh, yes and no. I thank you very much. But if you don't mind, I say we should, we should, we should doesn't solve any problem. We Baha'is believe that we have a blueprint to build the new society, the new world order. I was talking to a friend of mine who is friend of faith. And brought up this question that you Baha'is are always saying this, this, this. You had the same blueprint in your hand and first world war happened. You had the same blueprint in your hand. You were saying the same thing. Second world war happened. Now, do you have any guarantee that the third world war is not gonna happen? Or in this case, particular case we are talking tonight, that our life is not going to be dominated and go out of control of us and controlled by the robots. Yes, uh, I'll make mention briefly. The Universal House of Justice in its uh, message uh, of peace, the, the letter of the peace that they wrote in 1986, they answered the question. They say, will humanity um, as a result of consultative joy come to solve the problem? Or does it need another catastrophe before it realizes? So we do not know and we do not guarantee, but we call on the people of the world to join us to avoid that big catastrophe of the Third World War. But there's no guarantee. Thank you. Thank you. And all of us on this call tonight, we have our, our vision together and we're going to send out positive energy. Uh, Anna, your question from New Mexico, right? Hello, um, I was a nurse in the operating room for 42 years and I retired in 2012. And in 2010, they brought this giant computerized machine that was now doing the surgery. I never saw it operating, but it was the beginning of AI in surgery. And since then, I am fascinated to see what AI is doing in the medical profession. One of them was a an, uh, cardiologist on TED Talks who was saying that your retina, the back of your eye can now be, a photograph can be taken or an image can be taken and put into a machine and it will diagnose everything in your body. I thought that was amazing. Um, and also I have been watching um, a man from Israel talking about AI and spirituality. I can't find his name right now, but that was also very helpful. Wondered if you had any comments about the medical profession. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yes, medical profession can greatly benefit from the proper use. Uh, I emphasize proper use. Uh, of uh, imaging and of AI. Um, just to give you an example, uh, our son, Bayon, uh, he's a spine surgeon. Uh, and he used to do these complicated spine surgeries by putting screws and rods on the spine of patients and so on. Um, uh, and maybe an operation would take 12 hours that he had to stand and do. Uh, since a year ago, he wears a helmet uh, that does augmented reality. 
uh, takes an MRI of the patient after the patient is immobilized by anesthesia. And then the helmet helps him locate the all the intricacies of the vertebrae and where the nerves move so that uh, his uh, surgical tools do not um, harm the patient. And he can now do the same operation that he used to do for 12 hours. He can now do it in six hours. So it helps surgery. It helps medicine. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, uh, nearly every avenue of human endeavor can be enhanced and improved with the proper use. Again, proper use, meaning only if you bring the ethics into it. Thank you. That was a great question, which affects all, all of us, really. We all have medical intervention at some point, and um, our next operation might look very different. Riaz, do you have a question for uh, doctor? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful exposition of this topic and the questions that have uh, asked so far. Uh, here's, um, you, you mentioned something very interesting that, uh, for example, in that, in that case of whether inmates who are being freed, what are their probabilities of, of for inmates that are being uh, freed? Yes. What, what will be the probabilities of reoccurrence? And uh, you mentioned that AI would uh, examine exist, the existing trends in culture uh, to come up uh, with answers. And, and maybe some decisions may be made on, on that. So, but this principle that AI would take into account existing culture, I feel is, here's the conundrum that Baha'u'llah as a manifestation of God has, and his revelation, the complete Baha'i revelation, starting with the Bab, Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, the center of covenant, the Guardian of the Cause of God, Shogh Effendi, and the Universal House of Justice, in this whole revela new divine revelation, they have upended the principles upon which society operates, even the fundamental, the fundamentals of social order. So now they have introduced in the world a new cycle the cycle of fulfillment based on new, new fundamentals, new concepts, new principles, new methodologies, which AI may, may, may or may not know about. So my, my, my concern is um, that we should be careful with AI because it's not yet conscious of what this new divine revelation has brought to mankind. And, uh, and upon which the survivability of mankind depends, you know, uh, from current uh, trends in, in, in our culture, in world cultures, the degradation of the environment, uh, you know, and all other systems, food systems, energy systems, all, are, all of these are um, disintegrating institutions, all the whole order is disintegrating. And this is the basis upon which AI draws its knowledge. And th this is very dangerous because now the Baha'i revelation has brought in a new system, a new world, a new world order. And uh, included in this, in this new system is that science needs to be guided by the principles of divine revelation. Otherwise, it will lead to complete disaster. And we have become so expert in science that we are able to destroy life on this planet if, if, if science is left to its own, own devices and maybe if AI follows the current trends and all so this is a very sensitive issue 
that we are now uh, um, faced with a such a powerful such powerful science and sciences and yet it's like a wild and un unpredictable uh, being that needs to be checked and guided by by this by the well but this new divine revelation. What do you think? No, I fully agree. I fully agree. Um, you see, the uh, beloved guardian says that the Baha'i faith is scientific in its methodology. And in our clusters, we use data uh, of the kind that we gather at the uh, statistical reporting program, SRP. And we use these for, uh, 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 for, for analyzing and planning uh, the next cycle of activity. So we are not against data, but what we are against is blind data. Uh, you know, we, remember that when when these companies they use big data, uh, this is data without insight. If you take away the insight and the perception, and you only depend on data, then you may conclude that a certain group of people are uh, endowed with lower IQ, for example, than other people. This is just because of their societal environment. So I fully agree with you that uh, Baha'i Baha teachings, teachings of Baha'u'llah teach us to use science, to use data, but use it intelligently. 